If you're a pop culture junkie who loves TV, film, music, comedy, and other really important stuff, then you've come to the right place. Get ready and settle in for Classic Conversations, the best pop culture interviews in the world. That's right, we circled the globe so you don't have to. If you're ready to be the king of the water cooler, then you're ready for Classic Conversations with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. All right, Carly, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. You get the show going each and every week, and this week was no exception. Welcome, everybody, to episode 299 of Classic Conversations. As always, I am your host, Jeff Dwoskin. Great to have you back for what's sure to be a side-splitting episode with comedian Deanne Smith. We're talking all about Deanne's Netflix special, Deanne's new album. So much to get to, and that's coming up in just a few seconds. And in these few seconds, Rhonda Handsome was here last week. Rhonda shared so many great stories working on the movie Pretty Woman, her time with the Muppets, and being on the first episode of Saturday Night Live. So many great stories. Do not miss that. But right now, do not miss my conversation with Deanne Smith. We're talking comedy and more. And there might even be a reference to a tiny pineapple. You're going to have to stick around and find out. <laughs> Enjoy. All right, everyone, I'm excited to introduce my next guest, comedian, writer, troublemaker. Please welcome to the show, the super hilarious Deanne Smith. Hello. Oh, my God. Hello. How's it going? It's going great. And you are super hilarious. I was watching a bunch of your specials and like your online stuff, and you are hilarious. And while I was digging around, I accidentally came across the fact that you're going to be in my town in January. So at Mark Ridley's oh my Comedy gosh. Castle. Yes, I can't wait, actually. Man, I love that place. Is it January? I yes. Think it, yes, I think it was January 2024. Yeah, let me make a note. I have ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been a minute since I've been there. I love that place. Do you know that as a comedian who lives in New York City at the moment, I am, I got a bit of a Zillow problem. I am constantly looking at houses in Detroit because Detroit's lovely and it's so much more affordable than New York City. I think everywhere is more affordable than New York City, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what type of houses in Detroit are you focused in on via Zillow? Because I know that's a thing, getting addicted to Zillow. And Oh my God, it's so fun. I'm just dreaming around. Like I'll go, I'll go pretty far with it too. Like I'll be looking at the house and then I'll like get on the Google Maps and be like, what would the walk to the grocery store look like? <laughs> I think it's I think it's a fantasy thing more than anything else. But what am I looking for? I mean, let's put it out there. We're looking for two to three bedroom, one and a half bath. We want a nice yard. We want cute neighbors. We want a tree lined street. Basement? How important is the basement to you? Sure. We got we gotta put the body somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. So maybe when you come in January and you'll just fall in love again with the place and you'll you'll just stay. I mean, truthfully, if I fall in love with Detroit in January, then I'm meant to be there. I mean, that's that's real love. That is true. And De Detroit is, I don't know when the last time you were there, if you've ever if you ever actually made it to Detroit proper, but it's getting pretty cool down there. Pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. I love it. I love it. It's so great. Now, New York, you know, everyone always fantasizes New York, but New York always has like, every time I've been to New York, there's just tons of garbage on the streets. Like you can't walk up and down. I mean, there is a fair amount of garbage on the street at all times. I'm also, I was just in Toronto doing a comedy festival there and Toronto is so clean by comparison. I think it's the main thing that people note when they go to Toronto. They're just like, man, this is a city. What, how is it so clean? I know. Cause I mean, I mean, New York, I love being in Times Square. Like to me, like that sensory overload is like the greatest thing ever. But even you're the only one I know that's ever said such a thing. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. I don't mean the fear of being, you know, knifed by some guy in a homemade Elmo costume charging you a dollar <laughs> for a photo. I don't mean like that part, but like just the all of it. It's just like, it, I keep oh, mind, I'm wow, just okay. a tourist too. So it's not like I don't live there. And yeah, so I don't have to deal with that on a daily basis. It's in short spurts, but I don't know. Listen, it's not nothing, but it does. I find it stressful, like to emerge from the subway in Times Square. And then there's so much light. To me, it's super disorienting to be like, is it daytime? Like, I, I'm never sure exactly like what time it is. It's uh, yeah, 
yeah, there's a few ways to look at it. It's an incredible technological feat. It also really makes me feel like, oh, we're we're for sure in the end times. Like this sort of thing is not sustainable. There should not be this many lights and this many hot dog vendors. We this is not sustainable. That is a lot. It is a lot. My I think my favorite thing I ever did in New York in the Broadway area was hunt down Jeff Goldblum. Like I I bumped into him. And then realized, oh, I should have asked for his photo and then chased him like three blocks. Really? Like, yeah. was it a was it a fast walk, like a fast paced walk? Yeah, or yeah, did yeah, the chase yeah. you like? know, because okay. you know how they walk around after the plays yeah. that they're in and stuff. But you were trying to be subtle about it. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. A certain level of subtlety is, is needed. <laughs> did he accommodate your request? Oh, yeah. I got a photo. My That's biggest so claim to fame, I met him on the streets in New York and Ben Vereen. They were the stars of 10 Speed and Brown Shoe. It's some random show they both starred in way back, probably in the 80s or something, <laughs> which was my favorite thing to tell them when I met them. I'm like, oh, now I have photos with the whole cast. <laughs> oh, that's really fun. That's very cute. Did you try to bond on a Jeff level as well? I had one second with him. And this was like the time where you had like the two meg camera. You know what I mean? Like, right. OK. OK. So it wasn't like with the camera, like selfies or anything like that. It was like, put the button, get it going, <laughs> let someone else take the photo type thing. It's so it's a little bit more of a process back in the day when everyone's like two meg. I'm like two meg was such a big deal, but two meg photo <laughs> file. So you didn't, and, yeah, didn't bring up the Jeff connection. No, no, no. Which I should have because usually I do because it is a bond. There's no Jeffs anymore. Once we die out, we're like the dinosaurs. It's true. It's very hard to imagine a baby called Jeff. Yeah, there's it. It's not. It's they're done. Done. It's and when I was in high school, like everyone was Jeff, Jeff or Jennifer. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Or Jessica. Yeah. And so, yeah. But all right. Well, enough about me and my hunting down of Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> Tell me, uh, Deanne, about, I know you've had an illustrious career and many, many comedy specials and shows, and we'll get to it. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. <laughs> but um, you didn't start comedy till you were 25. Listen, Jeff, I started even later than that because my, my age is wrong online. By a few years, not enough to make a difference at this point, but uh, felt important back when I started when I was, quote, 25. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I didn't I didn't start until I guess I would be kind of late. I spent a lot of my 20s evading real life and or I don't know, making the best choices possible. I was living in Mexico teaching English for much of my 20s, just hanging out, hanging out at the beach, writing poetry. And then when I moved to Montreal, that's when I started comedy. OK, so where were you born? Let's start I there. mean, it's it's going to get convoluted. Which country? Was well, let's just go by country. We can. <laughs> yeah, no, I was born in upstate New York. I okay. Was born so... in upstate New York. All right. And then in my 20s, when George W. Bush stole the state of Florida, listen, I thought that's as bad as it was going to be. I was like, I got to get out of here. So I went to Mexico for a while and skipped right over the U.S. and then went back to Canada. So yeah, I didn't move back to the U.S. until 2020. <laughs> what an incredible time to move back to the United States of America. So the hanging chads thing. Thing, got you so rattled. You said, I'm out of here. I'm leaving the country. Honestly, I could see, I can never predict that we would end up where we are now. But I have to say that as, as a naive and somewhat idealistic 20 year old, I was looking around going like, oh, um, democracy isn't real, turns out. That was and, uh, the uh, first baby step, I oh think. Oh my God. And yeah. at this point, it's like a cute frat boy prank almost. Oh, his brother gave him the state of Florida. How sweet. Jeff, I'm freaked out if you can't tell. Freaked out. I think there's a lot to be freaked out about. It's a scary time for a lot of people. But let's focus on the happy for a minute. <laughs> I see you absolutely calculating like who your listeners are, where their political beliefs are. Let me just say this. I think we got to come together, guys. I think it, we're too fractured. There's too many. I mean, I don't know who your listeners are. I don't know. But it's kind of blowing my mind lately how specific everything is, like how you can just talk to one group of people that are that already all think the same way. It's not, it's not ideal, Jeff. And I know I've taken it off the rails. And there's something about the look in your eyes that makes me want to continue to take it off. No, the rails. I, I'm it's fine with the It's not so much the audience or anything like that. I know whoever listens. They can listen or not listen. It's just whether I just didn't know if I wanted to go down that rabbit hole in the short time we had together. No, we don't want to. Listen, I don't have time to incite violent global revolution, but it's on my mind and I think we need it. OK, no, but I'm with you. I mean, I've got folks that look just like me that are voting against what I'm Jewish. And so there's like, I think oh, then you understand what I'm talking about. I 100 percent understand what you're saying. And yeah. like, it makes me uh, kind of really, really upset to even think about it. So that's I just didn't want to 
<laughs> Which is why, that. yeah, we should steer this <laughs> in another direction. But I do have to say that, you know, my initial move out of the U.S. was somewhat politically motivated. You know, I, I just didn't know how to exist in a country that I felt like wasn't reflecting any of my values. And at that time, gay marriage wasn't legal, all sorts of things. So fled to Mexico for a while, then fled to Canada. You just been jumping all over. I've been jumping all over. So were you always funny? I mean, so you <laughs> have well, I been funny yet, Jeff? But well, no, I'm you, sorry. You, let me please, please, please go on. No, but you're you're deep and insightful. So that's the root <laughs> basis for for anything that can later erupt as funny. So you're in your 20s, you're disenchanted, you move to Mexico, you're teaching English. Like, where? what's the jump to, oh, I'm going to become a stand-up comedian? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I first barely dabbled with it when I lived in Baltimore. That's where I lived before I moved to Mexico. And all that happened was I prepared a little three-minute set. I went to an open mic that I must have found on the internet or something. The open mic was canceled that night and then I never went back. <laughs> I just moved to Mexico. So there was there was a like vague fear-filled attempt early. Then I moved to Mexico, I was writing poetry. And then um, when I moved back to Montreal, well, which is bilingual and I really only speak English, but where it was a culture that I could at least speak one of the dominant languages. I was like, let me try this. Let me try this comedy thing again. Initially in, in Montreal, I was on track to get an MFA in poetry and I was doing like poetry open mics simultaneously with comedy open mics. And then comedy absolutely took over because poetry is lovely, but it's kind, it's hard to get a read on the room. You know, I would much, much rather hear people's immediate laughter and then, OK, did this work or did this not work than to be met with reflective silence that could really mean anything when you're doing poetry. So it's interesting. Like, I always thought that the reflective silence is what all these speakers love. Your TEDx's, your you know, all this, like, like, because you don't need a reaction. I'm with mm. you, though. I can't be in front of a crowd. I can't even go in front of people at work and go two minutes without trying to evoke some kind of funny comment or something, because otherwise I just feel like I'm going to die. But I think it's that silence that like a lot of these professional speakers and stuff that really, unless they have that one canned joke that they, they build up. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. It's the silence that it would that works for them because they don't need the reaction. They did the end. Someone go, that was brilliant. I took lots of notes. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so, yeah, no, I definitely hear you. Give me a reaction. Yeah. The speakers the, with the with the canned jokes. It's frustrating, man, because at that point, people are desperate. People are desperate for a laugh. But they get a lot. They get a lot on those little tiny canned jokes. Right. But you um, know, just like I know, you can tell if you're in the audience, you or me, what kind of laugh it is. Like, <laughs> like right? It's an exhausted laugh or the boss's you know, reaction to a boss laugh versus like oh a visceral real laugh. There's a difference. There's a difference. There's a difference. Your listeners probably already know this, but what do you do? What else do you do for work? When you said you can't go two minutes at work. Oh, well, right now I'm self-employed, but I just mean like I used to work at Little Caesars headquarters. <laughs> Oh, fun. Okay. I used to, you know, work for just a bunch of corporations most of my life because that's what you do <laughs> when you grow yeah. up. Yeah. And so, you know, but I would speak a lot at the at the all hands meetings or whatever. And so that's where I kind of actually got my started where people then were like, Oh, you should do comedy. <laughs> you should try oh, it. You wow. should go okay, take that's a so try, interesting. Yeah. So yeah, because I never liked being in front of people and, like you said, the silence. But it's a weird jump, right, to want that because it's easier to get up there and just deliver a speech. Here's my bullets. Here's what you're learning. And no reactions. There's a certain level of, it's a whole different level, what you do in terms of being a stand-up comic where you're oh, getting constant, constant laughs. I mean, that's... Yeah, absolute vulnerability. To have it be clear what reaction you want and then have everybody in the room know whether or not you've achieved what you are so desperately craving. There's one measure of success and it's the sound of laughter. The other way it's the measure of success is no one booed you off stage. And yeah, like, so yeah. it's so much harder and uh, more noble to be a comedian. What, even going backwards again, made you strive for that, right? Because you're writing poetry, yeah. right? So people don't need, I'm, I'm assuming it wasn't uh, joking haikus or something like that. It was not joking right. haikus, although I did try to be accessible. I think that I've always been interested in writing and I think that poetry and comedy actually have so much in common in terms of economy of language is important. You know, you're trying to get somewhere oftentimes in the in the quickest way that you possibly can or the most direct 
way that you can. And both of those things, um, as you said, poetry, you know, involves a much greater range of expression and emotion than say we allow for in comedy, which is so narrow, laughter, 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 laughter. But with both of those things, you know, you're trying to elicit some kind of emotional response. So I think they have a lot in common. And I think the seed was planted when I was a kid, never went to live comedy shows. I never saw a comedy show until my first open mic. That was the first comedy show that I ever saw. But when I was a kid growing up in the 80s and 90s, just even with basic cable, these comedy shows were everywhere. It was like a big boom. So my dad would always be watching comedy shows and it was the big names, you know, or people who became big names. But you're seeing like Tim Allen and Roseanne Barr and Rosie O'Donnell and Ellen and Paula Poundstone. And you're seeing these people do like short sets. I don't know if it was Night at the Improv or whatever it was. But I remember, I think it just got into my head at that time, just like kicking back late summer nights with my dad watching comedy and kind of wondering, you know, like, how, how do you get there? Like, what happens? You know, where are those brick walls? And how do you get in front of them? <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. But I have to take a quick break. I do want to thank everyone for their support of the sponsors. When you support the sponsors, you're supporting us here at Classic Conversations. And that's how we keep the lights on. And now back to my conversation with Deanne Smith. It is funny when you look back at those evening on the improvs and it's like every single one is like a huge star now, you know, but back then, like you said, it was just, they were just kind of starting out. So it was just kind of in you to, to, uh, evoke emotion from your writing and, and then you just switched emotions. Huh? I think so. Yeah. That's all I can really imagine. I mean, not to get, no, or, or to get super cheesy about it. It just always kind of felt like a calling. I have to say it's the only thing that has really stuck that I've been like deeply interested in and just intrinsically motivated about, you know, you, you talked about having the corporate life for a while. I could never, I, I just, I have no desire or motivation for that, that sort of thing. I've never really had a conventional or traditional job. It's always been about stand up and part of the reason, and I will go ahead and get a little emotional and deep here is that early on when I started um, and I was still doing open mics and I had, I remember how I had my first paid gig and we can back up in a minute and I'll tell you how truly horrible it went. But coming back from that night, I was already in my twenties and it was the first time that it occurred to me that I could beat myself up over what had happened and put myself down and be mad at myself or that I could radical notion, be a friend to myself, kind of objectively look at the situation and decide what to do differently next time. So there was something about doing comedy and my desire to do it and my desire to do it well that unlocked a kind of uh, path to self-growth for me and allowed me to kind of look at the things in myself that were blocking me or keeping me from moving forward with comedy. Nothing else had inspired that sort of uh, reaction in me. So in that way, I would call it a calling. Like by pursuing comedy, I'm like growing as a person. That's all I really want in this world. That is great insight. Thank you for sharing that. It's an interesting profession, comedy, because it's one of those things where the best growth comes from literally bombing in front of a lot of people, <laughs> right? Totally. And yeah. I, I'll, I can back up and tell you that story, but I, I've always thought it's so interesting because it's like, I can't think of another thing. There may be another thing, but I can't think of another thing where your failures are so public, right? If you're a musician, you can, you can work on, I don't know, your fingering, your tabs, whatever musicians work on, your scales, you know, you can get to a certain level of competence on your own in your bedroom. But when you're a stand up, you absolutely need to be public. You can't do it on your own. You can't can't practice alone in your bedroom. You need the crowd. You need the back and forth. And so all your successes are public. All your failures are public. And you only get better by failing. So you have to come to terms with that pretty early on that uh, you will fail and people will watch it happen. <laughs> people will be there for it. Yes. I remember like starting out and there's always some people that would come see you multiple times. But as long as you did pretty good the first time, they could understand and empathize with you when it got bad because they know, oh, well, Deanne was great last time and this was an audience and this happened and this. They can understand with you how it happens. But those folks that just show up that first time and you bomb, <laughs> there were people that never <laughs> come back. They just don't, oh, <laughs> Jeff and his I hobby. Mean, you know what I mean? Like, and they just, they never come back. <laughs> Yeah, that gig that I did, the first one I got paid for, I had been doing open mics in common, er, excuse me, I had been doing open mics in Montreal, the little town outside of Montreal called Chateauguay that I had no experience with. You know, I was just used to a certain type of Montreal crowd. 
We go out to this tiny town. I felt like I had traveled back in time. Like just everything about the place, styles were different. People were different. And also they're just people. They just want to laugh. But I had been maybe developing in in kind of a narrow way. Plus, I mean, I wasn't good yet. I had barely 10 minutes. I was meant to do 10 minutes. That was an absolute stretch for me. I got on stage. They were polite. You know, nobody booed me. Nobody interrupted. None of us was having a good time. My bullshit was not resonating with them. And I was so green that then, of course, I was just like getting nervous and probably looking uncomfortable and making everybody else uncomfortable. There's a you want to at the very least be having fun and invite people to come have fun with you. But probably after about minute three, nobody was having fun. Oh, by the way, also, I went up, I'm sure first it was like the host and then me, the middler that absolutely destroyed. And then the headliner absolutely destroyed. There was nothing wrong with this room. There was nothing wrong with these people. It was all me. And at the end, this woman came up to me and said the opposite of what you want to hear as a comedian, the absolute opposite of what I'm trying to do. And she had love in her heart. She meant this in a good way, but she came up to me after and she goes, oh, honey, we felt so bad for you up there. I was like, Jesus Christ. And I was getting a ride from the Midler, I think. I had to stick around. I mean, the other people wanted to stick around and like celebrate their success. So I'm just there now in this bar with all these people that feel bad for me. (laughs) Just, um, you know, trying to smash back a drink with these guys that had killed um, and just sitting there taking it, trying to figure out like, what is the lesson here? What are we doing moving forward? The lesson is Sometimes just don't make eye contact after the show and leave. (laughs) Yeah, get the hell out of there. Um, But I have to say it was my first paid gig. I did 10 minutes. Club owner slapped $100 in my hand as soon as I got off stage. And it soothed the burn. (laughs) That $100 was like, fucking, all right, okay. Well, in a way, too, it's like everything's a learning experience. And if they hired you, they likely have seen you. So they, they know. I think they're willing to invest in probably young talent that they know just needs to get slapped in the face from the audience a couple of times to build up those chops because that's the only way, right? Yeah. And this was a while ago. This is, and this is the club system. I have no doubt that there was probably some perverse pleasure that everybody took in giving someone an opportunity a little bit before they're ready um, just to see what happens. As you evolve and you work with people, there's nothing better than watching one of your friends who you know normally could crush just suffer. (laughs) No, <laughs> I do not agree with that. I know. I'm um, just, I'm just being silly. I want to see everybody win. Although it is funny, like when overall, when a friend is doing well, and then they, they maybe have a line or two that doesn't work, and then you kind of see them like melt down a little bit. That part's fun if you, if they can recover, you know. And if it's kind of like, oh, that's like, what, that's I kind can of, see that's that kind of what I meant. That's more like what I meant. I meant in a fun way. I can't watch anybody just bomb. I'll leave the room. I can't. I can't do it. I remember like um, when I first started. First couple of times I killed. And then the third time, just to kind of parallel your story, it was, but it was my wife. I did so bad. The third time my wife was like, oh, if I was you, I'd be crying right now. <laughs> Excuse me. Wow. That's so intense. It was bad. It was bad. It was like, you know, sometimes I think like you ever watch um, that Matthew Perry show they did after friends, the studio 54. It was no, like- I never even heard of it. Okay, so there was like when 30 Rock came out, the guy who did the West Wing did like Studio 54 or something, which was like a behind the scenes Saturday Night Live type show. There's a really cool scene where they're like, I don't get it. That joke killed in dress rehearsal. And they're like, well, the difference was it was like reaching for the salt or something or something, some joke at a table. And says, well, in dress rehearsal, you ask for the salt. And when you were live, you asked for the laugh. Oh, that is so interesting. I love that. To me, like that was it's such a... Uh, kind of a a great way to understand like the difference in how your own delivery of something can alter how the audience reacts to it, even though you don't necessarily do it on purpose. But that's like you said, that's part of like, it doesn't work. And then you kind of learn from it and then adjust for the next time. But yeah, yeah. I think that's initially what really hooked me with comedy too, is the infinite variables. I think it's kind of impossible to perfect because every night there's so many variables. Like Obviously, there's like the script. And if you're sticking to that or not, there's your delivery. There's your own energy level. There's the energy level of the audience. There's kind of meta things at play in terms of like what day of the week is it? What time is it? There's like the physical conditions of the club, like the lighting, the microphone, like all these little things. And like how interruptive or not is the wait staff. And there's just all these variables. And that's really like what I find so fascinating about it and so interesting. 
It is. I agree with that a hundred percent. There's just, there's so many little nuances or even just like you leave one word out when you're saying like, and like, it just, it changes the way someone will react to something or that's one of the reasons I never love doing two shows or something in a night is because if something magical happens in the first show, you yeah. know, it's not going to happen in the second show just because it was a moment, you know, like something yeah. happened. Oh, that's interesting. I like doing two shows in a night or three. It's like, you're already there. Let's keep it going, you know, but I hear you and I have had to learn to let the first show go, whatever it was, good, bad, magical. You absolutely have to let it go because you can't be comparing on the next show. And it's so easy to do. Like you're up there telling the jokes and you're doing little metrics in your head. Well, well, the first audience did it, did it. But the thing is, the second audience has no idea. They don't know that at all. So it, it's not useful, but it's very easy to do. Right. It's one of those things you have to train yourself. If it was going good, fine. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's like one of those things. So you kind of blew up comedy wise in the Canada scene. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Is what it, what is blowing up anymore? What What does any of it mean? Kind of. You but, were um, like, uh, I couldn't even memorize all these things. You were like Montreal's top 10 comedians over five years in the 2010s. You've been on like a million shows. Last Comic Standing. I want to hear about that. Everyone seemed to like you a lot. I mean, there's a lot to like. I mean, it's well-deserved. Yeah, hey, I mean, thanks. you only have to watch. Yeah. yeah. So I started in Canada early in my career. I started traveling to Australia, which has been great, too. It was, it was a great place to develop and meet other comics and just start doing one-hour shows as opposed to, like, you know, the Club 45. Just kind of recently come to the U.S. and I'm still kind of getting my foothold here. I First few years of the pandemic, I was not comfortable going out. So I really didn't do live comedy for quite a while. Just kind of starting to get back into it. Tell me more about Australia. So Australia for, for has, a New York girl, you've been everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> been. yeah. Australia has an incredible scene that I think more people are aware of. You know, obviously, um, Hannah Gadsby came out with Nanette in 2018, 2019 on Netflix. Absolutely exploded. And in many ways, like started a big conversation about what comedy is. But Hannah, for example, is someone that had been on the Australian scene at that point for over a decade and someone that was like on the airwaves over there, someone that you would see. There's so many great comics coming out of Australia that I think the world will get to start to know sooner than later. It's a very unique scene because it's so isolated. It's small and they have the US influence, obviously, like everywhere does. They also have the UK influence and then they have their own unique weird sensibility <laughs> and they're used to the kind of one hour show circuit so even even their greenest comedian is expected to put together an hour show you know in the first year or two of doing comedy and then create a new hour every year it's not impossible to do but when i started comedy certainly coming out of canada the main idea then you know that the grizzled old club comics would tell me is like you know they thought you had to be working on your 45 for 10 years to like get it perfect and i was like oh i don't know about that so it's interesting like what am i trying to say what people expect from each other in a certain scene right and i think in australia people expect a certain high quality level of new material every year and so they kind of hold each other to that standard and achieve it as opposed to the old model that it took you 10 years to to get 45 right that's a that's a very american comic model yeah and it's from, it's pre-internet, right? It's yeah. from the days where you could have your traveling 45 and just, you could work that on the road for years and years and years. Yeah, because any comic I can think of, like, it's harder to, like, if you spend 10 years honing that and you put out that album and everyone listens to it and I was like, oh, that's classic. And then, like, uh, Dane Cook. And then oh, he, a year later- Dane he Cook in a while, yeah. Well, I'm just saying, but then, like, but then, like, a year later, he comes out with an album and it's like, is it possible to be at the level of something that you had just honed for 10 years? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like Carlin seemed to knock stuff out every five minutes. And there's a lot of people that are prolific enough to do it. But maybe you're right. Maybe it's just the mindset. How many one hour sets do you have? I haven't counted them up, but I've done at least I'm sure at least eight to 10 one hour shows. Looking back on them now, like, would I take everything out of my first hour and absolutely stand by it? 
Probably not. Stuff gets kind of remixed and repackaged into albums or various specials. Starting to put or have put like a fair amount out there. I have two albums at the moment. I have a like hour special on a Canadian streaming service called Crave. So not everybody has access to that. I have the half hour on Netflix and then just kind of various television sets that I've done throughout the years that that material gets kind of burned. And what was I saying about this? I don't know. Let me ask it's you good, about it. It's good to put stuff out there. And not all of it, not all of it always hits the mark that you want it to, I'd say. Well, I figure if you have 10 hours, if you've done 10 one hours, even if you're like, oh, some of this I grew out of or some of this is like, what was I thinking? And you probably got a good five hours in there somewhere that you could just pick and <laughs> choose from at a given moment. Yeah, I probably do have a good chunk. Although, you know, things also just kind of become dated sometimes too, right? Oh, some of my best jokes were dated. <laughs> Can you do you do you have any in mind? Like, are you able to tell us one? I'd love to hear one. I don't know. There used to be a thing, some call thing you could save money on called 10, 10, 220. That I don't remember the mm -hmm. joke at all. I had a whole joke on it because it was like the biggest thing for a while. It was like every yeah. you couldn't go five minutes without hearing a commercial for this long distance because you know, long distance isn't even a thing anymore. Right. <laughs> oh, like, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A week or so ago, I mean, really recently in New York, I heard someone do like a Monica Lewinsky joke. <laughs> what are you doing? But I think it was kind of ironic. I think it was like, hey, here's something from way back when. But wow. 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 I mean, when I worked with Gilbert Gottfried, he was still making Ironside jokes. <laughs> like a Is that show like from a Battleship. No, yeah. no, like a TV show starring Raymond Burr from the 60s. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> That's actually great though, because it's like, if you're going to go back, go that far back because right. no one, it doesn't even feel that dated. It just feels like, what are right, we even right. doing? Like, yeah. Avant-garde. Yeah. Sometimes like the references are so, like I had a deal or no deal, no deal or no deal joke that I did, but I had to like repurpose it or make up a version to try and make it seem relevant because it was a lead into a different joke. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Things get complicated. You build a little like, yeah. Um, domino path sometimes with the jokes. It's like, ah, how do I get into this one now without this other one? Sorry to interrupt. I have to take another quick break. And now back with Deanne Smith. We're going to talk all about Deanne's Netflix special and new album. Uh, let's talk about your specials. Let's talk about the Netflix one. Then we can talk about your new one as well. So Gentleman Elf. I watched it. I watched this special. It was great. Thanks. I'm happy to see you smiling. I stand by it. You know, we recorded it in 2018. It came out in 2019. And I was really proud of that little half an hour. I think it's I think it's pretty sweet. To anybody listening, you cannot search my name on Netflix, which is so frustrating. You have to search the title of the whole series called Comedians of the World and then go to Canada and then check it out. So this was this new thing they were trying. They released like 47 specials on January 1st, 2019. <laughs> No, of course it got buried. There were 47 <laughs> specials. That said, at the time, I did get a lot of really lovely emails and kind of feedback from people that were like, oh, I came across this. This is really cool. And like the tiniest bit of hate, I think that unfortunately is un inevitable with the internet. And like I said, kind of our fractured communities and yeah, people just kind of ready to see something different from them and get upset about it just on the face of it. You know, they say if you upset someone, then you're right on the path. <laughs> you're doing great. Because <laughs> it's like, at least I'm glad you know it's buried because it took me a minute to find it. I did search. I didn't want to bring that up since you did. But yeah, so it's worth everyone listening. It's worth finding. I'll put directions to it because you do. You have to find this thing. And then Canada, I saw my friend Dave Marej Mar was in there too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He actually was from Windsor, which is right outside Detroit. Yeah. And we used to do open mics together. Really? That's so exciting. I had no idea. Yeah, Dave's awesome. Super funny guy. Super funny. Uh, yuck yucks. We used to do yuck yucks together. Oh, that's so and fun. he'd try and sneak over the border. This is pre 9 11 when you could. Was it easy enough for you to sneak over to yuck yuck? It was easy. Yeah. Because it was, yeah. they didn't care and we weren't getting paid. Right. Yeah. Once we started getting paid, it like uh, some of the clubs, then you could still do it because you were going to a comedy club. It all depended on if the person at the border, and you know those folks, they control your life at that moment, whether you yeah. go or don't. And so it was always, I had paperwork. I'm like, look, it's okay. I'm not, you know. Yeah. So. But yeah, I loved it. The little letter you read at the end. 
It's so funny. Oh, so silly. Yeah. I just, I wanted a, I wanted an ending, you know, that, that maybe coming from the world of doing the hour shows. It's like, I just wanted, I wanted something that felt like an ending and not just like the last joke. Good night. It resonated with me because it's like when you spend time with someone, you do kind of feel like you got to know them. And so yeah. I thought that was a, a very creative ending. <laughs> it was, I'm not going to spoil it, but everyone should go watch it. it go watch it. It's great. And it's, it's hilarious from start to finish. It oh. actually is. And I, yeah. I'm pretty hard on myself, but that one yeah. turned out. I'm happy with it. No, I liked it. I liked it a lot. You got a new special, Shawini in a tank top. Did I say that right? <laughs> <laughs> you did. Okay. So this is an album. Okay. It's an album. I named it this, uh, I named it this based on one of the tracks about gender. So essentially it's just like, listen, anything goes with my gender. Call me whatever you want. Failed woman, weird man, Chawini in a tank top, whatever, whatever. But yeah. I wasn't sure what to call the album. There's another track called, I think the track is called We're All Fags. And that's what I wanted to name the album. <laughs> but I was dissuaded because we were like, listen, it's not going to get airplay and no one knows what you're talking about. I'm like, all right, fair enough. But this is an album you can find on 800 Pound Gorilla or anywhere that you find albums. And you could just buy it at a price that I must say is insulting to everyone on every side of this interaction. It's insulting to you as a consumer. It's insulting to me. It's insulting to everyone involved in the production. Merely $5, less than a cup of coffee. I think we can blame Louis C.K. for that. He, when he started selling his stuff, he sold them all for $5 when he started doing that way back when. Not to evoke Louis C.K., but the... Um... But when he started, created his first yeah, special yeah. on selling. Well, he, it, he it had the fan bucks. base to like generate yeah. a lot of income with five dollars. I mean, mine should be five thousand dollars considering the work that went into it. At least. <laughs> Let's uh, what's your Venmo? And then everyone, if you could just Venmo uh, Deanne the difference, we would greatly appreciate <laughs> it. And don't be don't be a dick. Don't say it's for a business transaction. Note that she's a friend. <laughs> So yeah, the no. fees do don't do get that? applied. I never say business transactions. I know, right? Do they set the price? Is that how that works? Oh, yeah. And I'm just being cheeky about it. I I have always felt nuts invoking money and commerce. I know it's what we do. But honestly, I really, it feels antithetical almost to like doing comedy. Like I'm there to connect. I'm there to make people laugh. And bringing money into it always feels so weird to me. So that's just my fun way of being like, hey, you could buy the album for five dollars. <laughs> it's right, just right. $5. for five dollars <laughs> to support yeah. somebody, a creator. But this is this is growth for me because uh, years ago I would be like, oh, whatever or don't or it's free or just message me or who cares? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Everyone Never goes spend the five dollars. You can have it. it forever. I used to like get merch and then just give it away straight up. Like I didn't even get back what I paid for the merch. Someone would be like, can I buy that t-shirt? And I'd be like, you could just have it. Just have it. Thank you so much for your support. <laughs> I used to, I made uh, bumper stickers once and I was just like, I just could not bring myself to sell it because it was like, you know, $3 or this or that. Yeah. Oh, you know, <laughs> you know what I ended up doing, which is kind of funny. I had this joke in the beginning where I tell people I'm Jewish and then I'm like, oh, if you never met a Jew before, you come up to me after the show, you can give me a hug, a little Jew hug, a little Jew brace, $5, $5, right? That is it Gets funny. that cute. I'll, I'll insert the yeah. big laugh that it would have gotten in front. Because then they're like, oh, the Jew won the money. So after oh, the God, show. Oh, God, I didn't even put that together. Yeah. I was like, they should pay <laughs> That's because you're an Jewish angel. person. You're an angel. <laughs> yeah, and, so, so um, and so after the show, it was just a joke. People, some people would come up to me and hand me five dollars. Someone once handed me twenty. Oh, funny. They'd they'd give me a hug or they'd take a picture. And then as a joke, I created one of those little Venmo things, you know, like where you can Good scan you. the Venmo. And so I just wrote hugs under it. And they as people walked out, so they could just scan that. <laughs> Smart. I mean, why not? Let them do it. Then I didn't have to create any merch, just me. Lovable me. <laughs> Yeah, if you want to interact, give me money. <laughs> exactly. It was um, only one time that somebody walked by me and kind of gave me this look and went, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, Perhaps a fellow Jew that was like, listen, I am also one of God's chosen people. I don't need to give you money to be near you. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes people would scream out from the audience. Anyway, okay, so there's a couple of things I wanted to make sure we covered. Uh, everyone's always talking about uh, Firefly. You know the show Firefly? You know, oh, just I mean, one I've season. I've heard of it. It's like one yeah. season. It's like the one show that has one season. And everyone's like, why isn't there more? Why isn't there more? So what I, I wanted to ask you about 
uh, The Adventures of Tiny Pineapple. Oh my God, this is so long ago. I forgot about this. Oh, wow. Completely forgot about this. Yes, yes this was nine years ago, pineapple. but it was Was it only short. nine years ago? God, it feels like feels like 25. Well, when you posted it, it's been nine years since maybe you posted it, but it's- um, Holy shit, okay. Something you did with Carly Houston and Robin Romer. I mean, the thing about Carly, Carly's like a very famous director now. Carly has gone on to win awards, directed Drag Race. I mean, I'm not even sure what projects they're working on right now, but yeah. And Robin's a therapist now. <laughs> it's a while ago. Well, any creator out there is just sitting at home with a pineapple and googly eyes and they're like, I need inspiration. The Adventures of Tiny Pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Thank you. I'm going to have to rewatch. We we did some fun stuff. I mean, those guys were, I did the voice of Tiny Pineapple and I think we came up with the stories together. <laughs> stories as they were. Those two were like very skilled director and photography people that like brought some high quality to this tiny pineapple we found at the grocery store. <laughs> ah, there's one where the pi tiny pineapple walks a dog and then the dog is eating the pineapple, which I imagine is what drove Robin into becoming a therapist. <laughs> she had to deal with the trauma. A lot of trauma there. A lot of trauma. And then you ever going to bring your podcast back? Question oh, my God. This is worth asking. Questionable at best. I would say, well, no, it's not coming back. My self-sabotage got in the way of that project. It was a great project. We we're all having a good time. Well, two things happened. Self-sabotage, the deep question of why would anyone want to listen, even though lots of people were listening and enjoying. And my mom died in 2015. And the podcast was so vulnerable and open and just kind of talked about my real life that I did not know how to do both of those things. So I put that aside, grieved. But I do have a new podcast project coming back soon, similar in tone, I guess. It's called Bad Boundaries. I don't even have the teaser up yet, but um, if you guys want to just keep your eyes and ears open for Bad Boundaries, it's going to get weird and it's going to be fun. That sounds delightful. All right. We'll keep, a, uh, keep an eye out on that. And then, oh, just um, I just found my um, list. We were talking about you blowing up in Canada earlier. Yeah. 2012, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, Amused. Moose top 10 shortlisted. Incredible. Who cares? Thank you, Jeff. But who cares? I know. But these are, I'm just saying there's you got you. But you were recognized a lot of times. So that's all I'm saying. So which is great. Yeah. I mean, it's cool. I love it. You need that stuff. You need that stuff to like, or I did at least to know that you're on the right path, that it matters a little bit what you're doing and that you're not maybe 100% delusional, maybe just 49% delusional. It's a good push. It's a good push. It's, yeah. a, it's a good, the universe letting you know you're on the right path for sure. All right. One last thing. And then I know I've kept you so long. So talk to me about straight men, step your game up. I watched this, your viral video. <laughs> yeah, that went crazy. I think that one came out in like, 2016, it came out of the Winnipeg Comedy Festival. It was a little four minute set. I think they called it Straight Men Step Up Your Game. I don't think that's what I called it. But essentially, it was about I'm dating this girl. She's only dated men until now. And it is so easy to impress her. So I just kind of go on about that. And it really resonated with people at the time. I mean, I think the the idea of the quote, you know, mediocre white man that we've heard so much about since and the bar being low, I think at that point, People weren't really talking about it. So it, it went crazy viral, definitely among like straight women that kind of wanted to hear this and definitely among lesbians and queer people that had had similar experiences to mine or the opposite experience of starting to date in the queer world and being like, oh, my God, this is so different. What's interesting about that, and I brought up self-sabotage a little bit earlier and being hard on myself, is it was a good lesson. I'm trying to keep it in mind, but I don't always, that I didn't consider that bit finished yet. Like I thought it was, I knew that it was getting good responses from audiences. I could read how audiences were feeling about it. It came out like relatively fully formed. Like there's always tags, there's always new lines. But when it came out, it came out in a way that was like, okay, this is its own chunk. I felt positively about it. And positively enough about it to put it on TV in Canada. You know, I knew it was good. At that point, Winnipeg had never released videos online. So that was like, whoa, what are they? So it was very, very surprising that that went viral and I didn't expect it to. And honestly, I thought I was giving it to a tiny little festival and it would live and die on Canadian television. And then I would be able to keep working on it and make it better. So it was a good lesson sometimes in me not thinking something is good enough and it being perfectly good enough for most people that aren't me. I felt it was a little too one-sided, honestly. Like I never 
I felt guilty to my male friends when I was doing that bit because I'm kind of putting straight men down. And I was like, the actually, the straight men in my life aren't like this. And I feel like I should give a little credit or bring it back around. But um, I never got a chance to bring it back around because the internet went, no, this is this is right. <laughs> straight men are, need to step in. No, it was great. It was great advice. Uh, my wife says, thank you. <laughs> generally it's just about giving the bare minimum to your women men just <laughs> care about their days the littlest bit oh this has been fun i appreciate you hanging out with me i i've had a great time we didn't know each other before this no and now we're like besties so is it fair to say yeah we just friends? got into it yeah um Dan, where can everyone keep up with you on the socials I mean, listen, good luck to you all. I've always had a bit of a push-pull with this old career thing. <laughs> but, uh, Google Deanne Smith. I'm the most successful one out there, or the loudest, at least. It's Deanne underscore Smith most places, I think. Right. Yeah. And on YouTube, The Real Deanne. I'll put links in the show notes. That's so sweet. I don't yeah. think I... Personally, I haven't looked at my YouTube in like 10 years. So, so, but I'm sure there's stuff up there. I'm sure. All right. So links in the show notes, everyone's homework, everyone's Deanne homework is follow the adventures of tiny pineapple. Check out gentlemen, <laughs> check out gentlemen elf on Netflix and uh, Deanne's latest album, Shawini and a tank top for $5, yeah, just $5. $5, you guys. I mean, if you, you just spend $5 on something that you'll never get back, but now you can spend it on this and enjoy it for a lifetime. Deanne, <laughs> a it was a whole lifetime, <laughs> a whole lifetime. Deanne, it was a pleasure hang out with you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll see you in January at what's it called? Comedy Mark Ridley's Castle. Comedy Castle. Yes. Oh my God. I will make I will make sure uh, that we connect there. That'll be fun. Thank you. Thank you. See ya. Yeah. All right. How amazing with Deanne Smith. I know. So amazing. All the links to all of Deanne's comedy goodness is in the show notes. Deanne is hilarious. I encourage you to watch all of it. And I'll even put a link to Tiny Pineapple. Well, with the interview over, I can't believe it. Another episode has come to an end. Episode 299. That means 300s next week. Can't wait. Special show. One more huge thank you to Deanne Smith. And of course, a huge thank you to all of you for coming back week after week. It means the world to me. And I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Classic Conversations. If you like what you heard, don't be shy and give us a follow on your favorite podcast app. Also, why not go ahead and tell all your friends about the show? You strike us as the kind of person that people listen to. Thanks in advance for spreading the word, and we'll catch you next time on Classic Conversations. Classic Conversations.